faculty, and he will be sharing new research efforts underway to better understand brain structure and function in mood disorders using a variety of methods in the context of treatment with rapid-acting antidepressant agents. These next generation studies will likely focus on more precise diagnosis and personalized medicine pr paradigm in order to develop better treatments for those who need them most. Dr. Zarate is chief of the section on neurobiology and treatment of mood and anxiety disorders, division intramural research program at the National Institute of Mental Health. He is also clinical professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the George Washington University and Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Howard Medical School. He is also a member of IBPF Scientific Advisory Board. We welcome you today, Dr. Zarati. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. I'm delighted to participate in today's uh, conference webinar, and I'll be reviewing an update on the research and treatment of bipolar depression uh, and bipolar disorder and also address uh, some of the research we're conducting in suicide as well. So to begin, mood disorders are a major cause of disability. Approximately 10% of individuals suffer from mood disorders each year. Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide, ranking ahead of many medical illnesses such as ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, cancers, and there's an increased risk of uh, death at any age, even after controlling for risk factors such as smoking and suicide. So it's estimated that there are pro approximately 1 million deaths per suicide every year worldwide. And depression is described uh, sometimes as a severe emotional state that causes a much worse physical pain, uh, it's a much worse uh, pain than any uh, medical illness has ever uh, caused. In terms of the impact uh, of research on medical illness uh, as, as on a whole, we can take two examples and compare and contrast these examples with uh, mood disorders. In terms of heart disease, we can see in this figure uh, on the bottom axis we see the year, and in this axis we see the number of deaths per year. We can see with interventions over the years, new treatments, medication, that has led to a 63% decrease um, in the death rate that's projected, which is about 1 million deaths uh, averted every year because of these new medications or preventive measures. And in terms of stroke, the, the story is similar. Here we have years in this axis and deaths per 100,000. We see a 70% decrease in the death rate. In fact, it was estimated that in 2005 that if you uh, showed up to emergency room very early on uh, with the onset of stroke symptoms, that about one-third left the emergency room with minimal or no disability. So how do we contrast these medical illnesses with mood disorders? Let's see what happens. Diagnosis in mental illness is by observation. Detection is late and prediction is poor. We don't know the etiology for many of our illnesses. And most of the treatment is based on clinicians' experience. Uh, there's, it's trial and error. There are no cures at, at this stage. And bottom line, in contrast to other medical illnesses for mental disorders, the prevalence, the number of those afflicted uh, from mental illness has not decreased for any illness. Where we have seen in stroke and heart disease, other medical illness, there has been a decrease in the prevalence. Mortality has not decreased for any of the illnesses major. In fact, the suicide rates have been fairly stable over the years, despite the introduction of a number of antidepressants. So the bottom line is we need to develop a treatment, and to do so, we will need to develop biomarkers. Biomarkers are biological measures that will uh, help us in, in, in the prevention, diagnosis, and predict who might respond to treatment. So let's begin with one of the major mood disorders, bipolar disorder. It's estimated that the lifetime prevalence is about 4.4%. There are about 9 million adults affected uh, with bipolar disorder. And if you look at a, one, a more severe form of bipolar disorder, bipolar 1, it's about 1%. The prevalence for bipolar 2 is about 1%. And then we have these in-between states, the shades of bipolar disorder, which is about 2.4%. So bipolar disorder is a common, recurrent, lifelong major psychiatric disorder characterized by 
disturbances in mood, and especially in activity levels. We tend to see it as occurring in several symptom domains. There is a manic and behavior domain where our patients may have euphoria, they may be grandiose, have pressured speech, be aggressive, impulsive, and reckless. And then we have more of a negative mood and behavior domain where individuals might have depression, anxiety, irritability, and hostility, and also violence and suicide. Here we see the same individual in a, in a very popular textbook during their manic phase of the illness and during the depressive phase of the illness. In addition, there are other symptom domains that uh, co-occur in bipolar disorder, including disturbances uh, with psychotic symptoms, delusions and hallucinations, and in cognition, distractibility, and race and thoughts. Now, I'm going to focus a little bit on diagnostic changes uh, over the years. One is looking at uh, diagnosis and based of symptoms, and then my presentation will be uh, talking about diagnosis based on um, neurobiology, as an example. The changes in DSM-4, the previous uh, criteria for uh, mania, um, had a predominantly elated or irritable mood in criteria A. But with the change in um, DSM-5, that led to the addition of energy and activity, viewing the disorder as a problem of activity and levels. I'll give you some examples why. Well, first of all, many individuals with bipolar disorder first present with a major depressive episode. The mania or hypomania comes later in the course of illness. The other reason why this change was considered was that most of our patients generally report egosyntonic or they generally feel well during their manic episode and not many during their hypomania or mania will complain of feeling well. Um, the other reason is that colla collateral informants, patients, uh, family members, and friends generally can infer about mood but not about behavior. And that led to uh, individuals are more likely to remember that there was a time in their life that they were hyperactive and quite energetic. And so the consequence of the DSM-4 uh, was believed that we were misdiagnosing individuals as having unipolar depression instead of bipolar disorder. And that, of course, could lead to inappropriate treatment. Now, others have viewed a diagnosis or outcome um, across stage levels. Um, here we see um, in, in, in this slide stage one, two, three, and four, um, where stage one is better and then stage four is worse. And on this axis, we see the overall function and, and prognosis from worse to better. So towards the left side of the figure, Early on, stage one, we see healthy individuals, and then as they become ill, they have initial mood episodes. But as the illness progresses, there's more number of episodes, there's cognitive decline, there's also more medical comorbidity, um, there's stronger family history, and individuals are less likely to respond uh, to treatment. So towards the end, we see that people have had many episodes or in a chronic depression, and have a cognitive decline. And it's believed that um, it's important to keep the stage and process in mind because it depends where you do the research, you might um, identify different um, um, uh, results. For example, you might see here the onset of inflammatory changes, whereas here you might see more significant inflammatory changes and significant uh, effects on cognition. Now, another way to look at diagnosis in, in, in terms of the genetics, people do have demonstrated that bipolar disorder is seen within the families. But it, what is not clear is, you know, how the, does uh, do manic episodes and depressive episodes transmit or pass on uh, in terms uh, of the genetics? And so in this study uh, done at NIH, lead uh, collaborate, uh, investigator was Kathleen Marikangas, the goal was to look at individuals or probands who had a manic major depressive episode or anxiety and to assess the relatives as well. And here we see 500 probands and 3,000 uh, relatives. And if you look at the episode of mania, the higher the number uh, indicates higher heritability. Uh, that means it passes on to the families or to the relatives. Those who had a manic episode we're more likely to have uh, a manic episode in a relative. Whereas for hypomanic and major depressive episodes, 
we did not see high heritability factors. We did not uh, scores. We did not see higher penetration in the family. So this bottom line means that uh, if one wants to look at genetics, one needs to look specifically at manic episodes uh, rather than lump in hypomania and mania depression, major depression. And if you look at how commonly associated is major depressive episode with mania or hypomania with mania or hypomania with depression, we can see that is non-significant. So which th this means is you find mania is as commonly associated with substance abuse or with panic disorder as it is with depression, yet we call it bipolar disorder. So for future studies, one will need to keep in mind that manic episodes may be transmitted individually. Now another way of looking at diagnosis is in terms of biology. And um, this is referred as, as an effort by NIMH called Research Domain Criteria, or RDOC, towards a new classification. So the focus is not so much on symptoms, but is on different levels of analysis, going from genes and molecules all the way to behavior. And the goal is to understand at each level one symptom domain. For example, the goal is not to understand all mania or all depression, but to understand aspects of the mania that might be shared with other disorders. For example, problems with work and memory, the ability to keep um, information retained, at least on a short-term basis, is going to be looked at in schizophrenia, in depression, and other disorders. The same with anhedonia, lack of drive or pleasure. One can see that occurring in schizophrenia, in depression, in anxiety disorders. The goal will be to perform this level of analysis on, on a domain such or symptoms such as anhedonia rather than a disorder per se. And that is the lead that will give us better insights into what causes uh, these illnesses because depression is viewed as many illnesses with many genes, many ideologies, and the goal is to narrow this down. For example, there have been efforts to define circuits in depression. And so towards the top of this figure, we see uh, there are individuals who have more predominantly cognitive problems and these brain regions have been linked to cognition. Whereas there are other individuals who have problems with insight, self-awareness, and these brain regions have been linked at that. And, bottom, and towards the bottom of the figure, we see people with drive, activity levels, uh, sleep, wake cycles. And so these brain regions have been linked to that. And of course, toward the right, we see mood states, other areas such as amygdala and thalamus. And so the goal is by coming and defining these circuits, depending on the predominant circuits affected, we would come up with uh, certain treatments. For example, medication would predominantly affect individuals, would take personalized, this would be personalized treatment. Um, then you would have cognitive behavioral therapy for individuals who have more aspects and, and these circuits involved in the brain. And then, of course, more device treatment, somatic treatment such as deep brain stimulation or vagal nerve stimulation would affect these circuits in the brain. And so this is towards a new way of looking at these illnesses to better understand. Now, why the need for better treatment? There have been four major uh, studies by NIMH showing um, that many people do uh, benefit from our treatments, but there are limitations. From this large study uh, called the STAR-D, patients were treated with standard antidepressants and what was found um, in 3,000 individuals that it took about six months or, high, or fit for 50% for of individuals to achieve remission. Two trials for six months for half of the people to achieve remission. That is pretty low. In another study, the step BD, only about 24% of individuals responded to antidepressants compared to placebo control group after 27 weeks of treatment. So these individuals benefit, but we can see a large number of individuals did not benefit from the antidepressant trial. Another study looked at the combination of antidepressants versus starting antidepressants alone. Would that bring about more rapid antidepressant effect? And the answer is no. And the other is for the short-term treatment with lithium over six months to individuals who had bipolar disorder, would that bring about 
benefits over placebo, at least over the short term, and the answer is no. So there are some individuals that do benefit, but there is clearly a need for better and improved treatment. And with regards to the previous study I mentioned, star D, we see four levels of care. On this axis, we see the remission rate. That means um, people are doing very well. And we can see with more trials, there's a gradual decrease in individuals doing extremely well, to the point that it's about 14% after four trials. So clearly these individuals benefit, but a large number of individuals do lead, need treat, uh, novel treatments, especially if they've failed previous treatments. Now in terms of the past 50 years, um, there have been limitations on the number of medications we've been able to develop. These are the number of mechanistically distinct drug targets in the 1950s for depression and schizophrenia, about two different drug targets, the same for heart disease. But after 50 years, we continue with few drug targets available uh, and few novel treatments. Um, most of our treatments are based on modifying or regulating serotonin or epinephrine what we refer to as Me Too drugs. And in terms of bipolar disorder, most of our treatments are based on repurposing anticonvulsant drugs, medications for seizures, or antipsychotic drugs developed for psychosis or schizophrenia. Clearly, individuals do benefit from these medicines, but generally, um, there is a large, fairly sizable group of individuals that do not benefit despite combination with these treatments. This argues for uh, improved treatments. Unfortunately, because we do not know what are the targets uh, to develop new treatments, we know very little about the etiology of our mental illnesses, um, it's hard to develop treatments. And that has led to pharma companies quitting or dropping out of uh, developing drugs. Fortunately, um, it seems that um, this is turning around, somewhat, turning around somewhat in recent years. Efforts such as from NIMH called New Experimental Medicine Studies uh, or FAST FAIL trials, uh, the acronym is FAST, um, is a project here to try to come up with a better uh, target, better technologies and biomarkers to develop the next generation of treatment. So the success rate of phase two projects is the lowest for any phase in the discovery pipeline, especially for uh, central nervous system disorders. And um, now um, it, it, there are situations where we may have a study where we did not see any separation from placebo. We do not know if the drug did actually engage in a drug target. And for that reason, we need to tap into brain systems with different technologies to better uh, identify biomarkers so we can identify the correct dose we can see actually if we tested the drug target. So the future will be taking advantage of new breakthroughs and, uh, breakthroughs and tools and to identify biomarkers of target engagement. That means that the, the drug target, the drug has actually binded to the target. One example is positron emission tomography, in this case, or PET imaging, PET. Uh, which is a, a way of using a radio tracer that binds to enzymes or receptors in the brain, and one can visualize it. In this case, we see serotonin and norepinephrine. We know that our antidepressants do bind to these receptors, and that has led to the, to the cyclic AMP cascade, where it's believed to be disrupted in depression. So here we see the binding to the receptor. We see cyclic AMP uh, in the BDNF gene expression, and that leads to uh, changes in plasticity in cell survival. Now, one of the enzymes responsible for this is phosphodiesterase uh, 4, in this case, PD4. We know that the majority of our antidepressants increase this cascade, which seems to be decreased in um, depression. And um, one uh, radio tracer uh, is a roller pram that binds to this enzyme. So indirectly, you will be able to measure this cascade based on this, uh, uh, on this uh, radio ligand, carbon-11 roller pram. So when uh, we looked at 
uh, patients with depression versus healthy controls who have you know, moderate to significant depression. And, um, and this is what one sees, that in healthy controls, the warmer color indicates greater activity of phosphodiesterase, or PD4, meaning greater cyclic AMP activities, which you would see. Whereas this activity uh, in the cyclic AMP cascade is diminished in depression by an average of 14%. So if you have an effective antidepressant, you would see that these colors become more warmer towards that of healthy controls, and that would be a measure of targeting engagement. In fact, in a study looking at different brain regions, you can see healthy controls have higher roller prime binding or cyclic AMP activity compared to those with depression. And with treatment, um, after eight weeks of a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, we see a 13% increase compared to healthy controls. Now, why do we need treatments? Based on what I previously mentioned, we see low remission rates, questionable efficacy in bipolar disorder, and a lag of onset of antidepressant effects. In this figure, we see a major depressive episode here euthymia in yellow and blue depressed. What our treatments do when we, init, when, when we start treatment, the monominergic uh, antidepressants such as those that affect serotonin or epinephrine, is that it, it takes about 10 to 14 weeks to have full antidepressant effects. What we expect with next generation antidepressants is to have a rapid onset within a few hours or day that's comparable to six to eight weeks of standard treatment. There are a number of drug targets here listed are some of the studies. Um, the bottom line is it, mood disorders are believed to be uh, disorders of uh, plasticity or cellular resilience. And a number of these treatments take advantage of enhancing this resilience or this plasticity. And these are a number of studies that done, have been done over the years. Now, in the interest of time, I'll focus mainly on the glutamate system um, and ketamine as a, a tool or investigated tool to develop better treatments. So these are some of the candidate glutamate drugs for uh, depression. Um, this represents the glutamate system. Glutamate is an excitatory amino acid, and it's important for neurotransmission, for learning, memory, and plasticity. Glutamate synthesized in the pre-synaptic neuron, it goes against the, uh, across the synaptic space and binds to these post-synaptic receptors. It is believed that in depression, this, the glutamate levels are dysregulated and are unable to be incorporated into the glial cell or unable to be um, um, incorporated uh, in, uh, at the neurotransmitter level, the NMDA receptor complex. Now, one can take advantage on different systems here or different targets to regulate glutamate levels more precisely. The area I'll talk about is the NMDA receptor complex, drugs that bind to this receptor and seem to lead to rapid antidepressant effects. Here highlighted we can see um, the NMDA receptor complex. It's a channel um, that's involved in learning and memory. There have been several drugs identified that do bind to different parts of this channel and regulate its function. One of them is ketamine. Ketamine binds to the PCP site um, um, and um, regulates its function. While ketamine binds to the site, it blocks uh, the channel's function that's temporarily affected attention, memory, and concentration. What is ketamine? Ketamine is an anesthetic. Uh, uh, it's, it's commonly used for diagnostic purposes in children and elderly patients. Um, it's similar to PCP, but 50 times less potent um, at blocking the and in the receptors. Commonly used as an anesthetic uh, and unfortunately abused by some as uh, a, a hallucinogen. But when used at uh, lower doses, it seems to uh, produce um, effects on pain, um, anesthesia, and also appears to have antidepressant properties. These are some of the properties, but to, to mention that its uh, use is predominantly intravenous. Others are, are looking at other forms of ketamine 
in order to make it more um, palatable or, or uh, user friendly in terms of, uh, of, of our patients. In terms of what to expect during an infusion of ketamine, um, individuals do have uh, issues with psychological symptoms, meaning during infusion they may have trouble, dreamy like states, trouble with attention, concentration, um, and have decreased awareness of um, the environment. Blood pressure may go up, uh, and um, uh, people may have um, a temporary uh, 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 hallucinations, impaired thought processes during the experience with ketamine. Now, um, this lasts about 40 to 80 minutes, but after the infusion, it goes away. So why uh, target the NMDA receptor complex? Uh, we talked about that uh, our antidepressants target serotonin and norepinephrine, but have to lead to the cyclic AMP, cascade changes, eventually changes in gene expression, and ultimate targets might be the NMDA receptors. So why not target this more directly with a drug such as ketamine? Would that bring about more rapid antidepressant effects? And so we and others have designed a series of studies to test the question. The question here is whether one single infusion of ketamine would bring about rapid antidepressant effects. And the answer is yes. Here we see time in minutes and in days. And on this axis, we see a depression score, higher number, greater severity. So people here have moderate to severe depression. In green, we see ketamine. and red, we see a placebo control. One infusion led to rapid antidepressant effects within a few hours, lasting a good part of the week. For the right, we see response rates to ketamine over time. Towards the extreme right, we see response rates to monominergic antidepressants, which is about 62, 65%, but after six to eight weeks of daily dosing. Here we see one infusion of ketamine and patients with treatment-resistant depression. On average, have failed six antidepressants that took comparable response rates to our current antidepressant within six weeks, within only a few hours to one day. In bipolar depression, I've already pointed out the lack of um, um, uh, many effective treatments. Um, here we see similar, the, the same thing, time in minutes, and, and this is the depression score, moderate to severe depression, one infusion of ketamine in patients with treatment-resistant depression led to rapid antidepressant effects within a few hours, lasting a good part of the week. This has been replicated as well. And in fact, now uh, there are a number of studies um, that have shown very similar rapid response rates to ketamine. One estimates about a 60% response rate at about 72 hours after um, one infusion of ketamine. And towards the right, we see individuals looking at uh, intranasal ketamine, different forms of delivering ketamine. And, uh, research is now underway to, um, to develop other forms of administering ketamine. Now, there are uh, attempts to di identify who will be more likely to respond to ketamine in looking at uh, at least 30 to 40 different clinical demographic characteristics, including number of hospitalizations, years, uh, ills, um, weight, um, symptom severity, previous suicide attempts. Uh, we come up with a few in the model. And towards the right, we see that weight, the greater the dose of ketamine, the better the response uh, uh, to ketamine. A family history of alcoholism seems to predict a better response to ketamine as well as a past suicide uh, attempt, a lower uh, rate of response to ketamine. And we can see this was at four hours after ketamine, and these same factors predict response at uh, day one. And one week later, only um, a family history of alcoholism was associated with response to ketamine. So these are different ways of trying to identify who will be more likely to respond to treatment. Now, what's the next steps in ketamine research and treatment? One is um, there are many groups out there looking to develop ketamine for clinical practice use. It's already being used off-label. Uh, um, some studies are looking at repeat infusions, 
uh, given uh, ketamine over its lower lower periods of slower periods of time to decrease the side effect profile. Others are looking at ketamine-like drug. Um, we are doing so. We're also trying to look at the mechanism of ketamine in the brain to develop better uh, targets. So how, could, how might ketamine be leading to a rapid response? And this theory has been proposed by Ron Duman at Yale. Ketamine and scopolamine, which uh, also produces rapid antidepressant effects, bind to the respective receptors on the GABA interneuron. When they do so, this leads to this rapid increase in glutamate. It activates these AMPA receptors and leads to a cascade of changes mTOR and also BDNF and, and ultimately leads to an increase in spine number and function which is believed to be decreased in depression. And so these uh, targets do uh, become very interesting to pursue in terms of drug development. Now um, using ketamine um, as an investigative tool one can take advantage of different technologies, including polysomnography, sleep studies, looking at metabolites in the brain, such as glutamate levels, PET imaging, which I mentioned. One can look at the electrophysiology of the brain on how one neuron talks to the other. We can look at circuits in the brain, uh, not just one region, but how one part of the region talks to another part of the region and to the structure. We are currently looking at these different modalities to understand how ketamine and other rapid antidepressants might be working. So in terms of um, the, uh, the RDOC looking at across a series of uh, levels of units of analysis, we can begin to start uh, filling in the gaps uh, in terms of what might be important, ranging from genes all the way to the symptoms to the diagnosis. I've given some examples. Uh, one can look at circuits uh, in, in terms of the brain activity. One can look at the brain, such as uh, 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 proteins, such as BDNF. And also can, one can look at symptoms to, to classify who might respond or not to uh, these different treatments. Now, taking one example, a, a major symptom or problem in depression is anhedonia, the inability to experience pleasure from uh, activities that are usually found to be enjoyable. Not, not everybody has anhedonia with depression, but many do. And not only does it occur in depression, but we see this happen in, in schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and anxiety disorders. And this is an example of the research diagnostic domain criteria, where one will look at different units of analysis on a symptom, key symptoms such as anhedonia. We've done so. We've previously uh, demonstrated that ketamine produces rapid antidepressant effects within uh, lasting about three to four days. But if one looks at specifically anhedonia, the lack of pleasure, that symptom in the context of depression, one sees an even greater antidepressant effect on the symptom of anhedonia as measured by the SHAP scale. That means greater improvement in anhedonia. And we see it is much greater than placebo and has a greater effect than actually the effect of ketamine on depressive symptoms. Now one can take advantage, and we have done so in our study, obtaining PET imaging looking at glucose, which is an indirect measure of glutamate. If you remember, the glutamate burst is what is believed to be key or important to the mechanism of antidepressant effect. This is an indirect measure of that. And we actually see in the ventral stratum, an area that's important and to reward and drive and motivation, that there is a relationship with increases in, in the glucose rate in the brain in those who have greater improvement in depression and specific in, in, in uh, anti-anhedonic effects. Toward the right, this is a sideway view of the, of the brain. And we see when we pull out depressive symptoms, from the pleasure anhedonia, we see that's a different brain region, the dorsal cingulate cortex. So this gives evidence that at least uh, we can begin to tease out symptoms from the core uh, illnesses to better understand what might be the genes or circuits involved in these symptom domains. 
Another example is suicide. We see suicide uh, as occurring in individuals with depression, individuals who have no mental disorder, individuals who have schizophrenia. So the strategy here is to look at suicide across different disorders. What is suicide? In some cases, evidence. This happens to be the picture uh, by um, Russell Sorge of a woman who jumped to her death um, in um, uh, and, and this is reported the first picture of somebody dying from jumping from a building. And we know that suicide happens about every 40 seconds uh, over the world. In about every 41 seconds, there's someone left trying to make sense of this tra tragedy. There's about 38,000 suicides in the United States uh, every year, 200,000 hospitalizations, and about 300,000 uh, emergency room visits. So there are different definitions of suicide attempt and self-injurious behavior, but suicide uh, attempt is referred as self-injurious act uh, committed with at least some intent to die. There doesn't have to be an injury or harm, but the potential for that injury or harm. Whereas self-injurious behavior is uh, there was no intent to die. The behavior is purely for other reasons. For example, to relieve an internal state of pain, um, to get attention, sympathy, or make others angry. So that's the main differentiation between suicide attempt and, and self-injurious behavior. There are risk factors, previous suicide attempts, mood disorder diagnosis, multiple medical, uh, mo multiple psychiatric or medical conditions. The more psychiatric diagnoses, one has the greater the risk for a suicide attempt. Losses, poverty, disability, isolation, lack of access to clinical care, and of course, access to firearms and medicine are risk factors. And in yellow, in this case, we need, I've highlighted what are some of the risk factors of one of our subjects in a study. 59-year-old divorced female who was disabled, had mood disorder, major depression, many comorbid diseases, alcohol dependence, six previous suicide attempts, a family history of suicide, and lived in isolation. She was admitted in a pretty severe state, feeling the worst she ever felt, having intermittent thoughts of wanting to hang herself or images of killing herself by shooting herself. We'll refer to her as uh, Rosemary. Now, there are current treatments. Um, um, for suicide behavior, the only one FDA approved is clozapine, uh, but there is no uh, approved treatment for suicidal thoughts. Lithium is not FDA approved, but there's evidence of reducing suicidal behaviors by not having specific effects on the suicidal thoughts per se. Now, in the previous studies, did report rapid antidepressant effects. Here we see rapid anti-suicidal effects with ketamine. So uh, this is suicide score, higher number, more suicidal thinking. Within 40 minutes, rapid improvement in suicidal thinking compared to the control condition. In about now 100 subjects, those who had suicidal ideation, we see rapid decrease in suicidal ideation scores, lasting a good part of the week within 40 minutes. So this has a potential to revolutionize management of acute suicidality, and there are now multiple studies going around the country um, looking at the anti-suicide effects of ketamine and um, other types of drugs. Now, um, there is work now going on looking at biomarkers of suicide, including changes in glucose metabolism, um, fear potential startle, and sleep studies. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on the first one, whereas one does PET imaging. I already mentioned this is a measure of glucose in the brain, which is an indirect measure of glutamate, which is modified by ketamine. It seems important to be, be important in depression. This is a side view of the brain, what we refer to as a sagittal uh, cut. And one can see subgenual um, cortex and infralimbic cortex. This is areas implicated in the effect of antidepressant. We see that Cerebral glucose met metabolic rate is increased in depression, and with, uh, as you can see here, the greater the suicide ideation, the higher the rate, the glucose met metabolic rate. 
and with the treatment with ketamine, it flips it down. We see that there's actually a decrease in the cerebral glucose metabolic rate with ketamine, and this correlates with anti-suicide effects of ketamine. So in this last slide, uh, last, uh, uh, slide um, to summarize um, my talk, um, we're trying to gain knowledge at multiple levels. Um, one is at the target level within the brain. Glu uh, glutamate seems to be an intriguing and important target. We do so with proof of concept studies, integrated with multimodal imaging and other techniques. And we believe that identifying biomarkers and new drug targets will lead to improved treatments. So we are gaining, um, we believe, knowledge at multiple levels. One level is the molecular cellular level where extramural studies at the university uh, fuels our proof of concept studies. We can test a target. And also, data generated by us and other groups are providing new insights so that our basic uh, scientist colleagues can conduct more mechanistic studies. For example, one, has, uh, one study has found that the increase in synapses uh, and spines is important uh, to the antidepressant effects of rapid acting agents. On another level, um, studies are being done at the circuit uh, uh, and systems level where the proof of concept studies are augmented with these multimodal brain measures and technology, measure neurochemical, function, circuit, high resolution um, neuroanatomy. This actually represents the hippocampus. Um, that's important in depression and memory. One can look at pathways within the brain. And then finally, um, at the uh, human clinical trials level, um, we are uh, being able to identify enriched biological subgroups. Right now, depression involves many diseases with many ideologies, and the goal of research is to identify subgroups, so to identify biomarkers, and hopefully that will lead to um, more personalized medicine down the road. So all, this, all these studies have been done, of course, um, at the intramural research, but with a, many um, collaborators, um, and we wish to thank them. And obviously, we wish to thank our patients and their families with which none of this research would have been possible. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Zarati, for that presentation. Um, I do have a few questions here. Um, let's see, the first question is, um, would you please discuss treatment of cognitive and functional deficits in bipolar using psychotherapy, medication, and co cognitive slash uh, functional remediation? Yeah, so um, um, with, with, with uh, uh, mood disorders, uh, um, including bipolar disorder, it's not uh, all about uh, uh, medications, and it usually it's a combination of medications and psychotherapy. And so there are different uh, psychotherapeutic uh, techniques. One of them could be to restore uh, rhythms and uh, rhythms in the body, uh, promoting uh, regular times of awakening, going to bed, structured activities to during the day. And that has been associated with um, uh, improvements uh, in the course of the illness. There are types such as cognitive behavioral therapy and different versions of this um, that uh, do get at, uh, uh, for example, at negative thoughts, stop at negative thoughts, I'm useless, I'm no good, I want to die, correcting those thoughts. And there are other uh, types of therapy which get more at um, aspects of um, having individuals uh, 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 be, being able to structure their lives where they can begin in small steps to, um, um, uh, to, to get back to work, uh, starting with a few hours, get into more hours, including some types of uh, vocational therapies and other types of therapy. So it's believed that these therapies integrated with medication might be very useful um, and, and important. And um, some of these different um, 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 psychotherapeutic um, um, techniques have been shown to demonstrate relapse and recurrence uh, of the illness, which is very important because what I talked about was coming up with um, 
new ways of understanding um, uh, how to intervene very rapidly in the course of in the course of the illness to minimize the the duration of the episodes of depression and hopefully minimize the number of depressions over the lifetime of an individual. Uh, we do have uh, therapies that have already been demonstrated to reduce the number of episodes of depression beyond enhancing compliance um, and integrating family as well. Um, uh, so the, the treatment of bipolar disorder is one about the course of the illness rather than uh, in just one episode. So I think it's very important to keep in mind that our goal is to minimize relapse recurrence through intervening early. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, next question, do we have cognitive impairment or improvement um, studies with ketamine? Uh, so that, that's a very important question. So uh, I, as I mentioned is uh, during the infusion of um, uh, ketamine, um, it temporarily blocks uh, this receptor, an MDA receptor, which is important to learn in memory. So during the infusion of ketamine, learning and memory is impaired. Uh, and um, uh, so what there have been uh, only a couple of studies um, and um, historically there have been many studies looking at cognition but more in the context of healthy volunteers or without other illnesses. We do know um, that the uh, memory um, um, affected, uh, the learning is affected during the infusion but not prior knowledge of that. And those who have uh, greater cognitive impairment, which is believed to be associated with depression, people have problems with attention, memory, concentration, uh, those with greater cognitive impairment seem to have greater uh, improvement to ketamine. And with regards to uh, one question which comes up uh, very commonly is, uh, will giving ketamine several times a week, two or three times a week, lead to greater cognitive impairment? But we already know that many of our patients suffer tremendously from cognitive impairments due to the depression. So it, it's our hope that with ketamine or ketamine-like drugs, which institute rapid antidepressant effects, will minimize the time one is depressed and thus minimize, if one recalls that figure, where the inflammatory changes uh, are occurring in other toxins or affected in the brain by minimizing the time one is in depression, we would expect that cognition would be improved over the course of one's life. Won't go downhill as much. So um, now the a few, another study has looked at um, cognition um, in individuals who received uh, uh, repeat doses of ketamine uh, in, in terms of the treatment for depression and has not shown any significant impairment in cognitive function. In fact, uh, one sees an improvement or uh, one would say a restoration of the probably, uh, to some degree, the previous level of function of cognition. However, it's very important to keep in mind that this, these are only a few studies with only a few subjects. We need more sophisticated cognitive measures, larger number of studies, and uh, brain imaging to show that um, uh, ketamine and ketamine-like drugs will be uh, uh, safe when given uh, over time. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, next question, what are your thoughts on TMS? On our TMS? Yes. Yes. So there are a number of uh, devices um, um, out there, um, the grandfather of all, uh, is actually uh, actually uh, uh, electroshock or electroconvulsive therapy, and um, ECT, commonly known, is a very effective treatment for depression. In fact, one of the most effective treatments for depression. Um, the uh, limitation, of course, of ECT is uh, the cognitive problems um, associated with with it. Um, and, um, and another potential limitation is, does it maintain the response achieved um, over time? Um, that has led others to start looking at uh, ways of uh, modulating um, electrical activity in the brain in a more safer manner, and that has um, led to uh, different devices, vagal nerve stimulation as one VNS, 
has led to uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, referred to as RTMS. Uh, and uh, there, there are other types of uh, uh, treatments looking at trying to um, change the, the voltage of ECT, uh, inducing um, shorter seizure duration um, from ECT in the hopes of um, a minimizing cognitive disturbance because ECT produces uh, seizures during um, the shock. Uh, whereas a treatment or device such as uh, RTMS does not produce um, um, uh, seizures. Um, one does not lose consciousness during the device. It's uh, very well tolerated. It's uh, currently FDA approved um, uh, for those who filled uh, one antidepressant treatment. Um, yeah, so as, as one uh, can appreciate from the earlier studies, uh, we do have effective antidepressants, but a subgroup response, not everybody responds. And then of those who do respond, there is uh, a relapse. So with regards to RTMS, there is a subgroup that does benefit from RTMS. Now, we have no way of knowing um, uh, who uh, or predicting who will be more likely to respond to RTMS or an antidepressant this time. For that reason, we are pursuing work uh, on biomarkers to try to see what uh, changes in the brain might predict that one would respond one over the other. So there is a subgroup that do benefit from uh, RTMS, but there are others that do not uh, ben seem to benefit from that. And it's very well tolerated. There is less data on the long-term um, effectiveness of RTMS in large populations, and some of those studies are uh, underway. Great, thank you. Um, are you involved in any research um, which addresses severe mania in bipolar disorder? Yeah, so we, uh, at, at this time, um, uh, at our site, we are not doing uh, mania. Uh, at this time, we're uh, focusing more on treatment-resistant depression. But we do uh, focus on um, also on individuals who have uh, what we refer to as rapid cycling bipolar disorder, meaning they may have uh, ha many highs and many lows within a year uh, period of time. Um, we are collaborating with others uh, in, in terms of biomarkers um, and other biological measures um, of, of understanding mania uh, and understanding depression. Uh, but uh, developing specific treatments, we are focusing more on depression. Um, and the reason for that is, is the following. Um, we have a number of antipsychotic drugs and a number of anticonvulsant agents that are use, being used for uh, mania, and they are fairly, uh, they're pretty effective in treating mania. So we do have some problems in treating mania, but it's not the largest problem of bipolar disorder. What is the largest problem of bipolar disorder are the depressive episodes. In fact, most of our patients with bipolar one and bipolar two spend greater amounts of time, nearly threefold in bipolar one in maybe 24-fold uh, for bipolar 2 in depression rather than mania and hypomania. And, and for that reason, um, others are now pursuing treatments more for the depressive side of bipolar disorder. But we will also uh, look at uh, preventing recurrent hypomanias and manias as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, next question. Do you expect the ketamine to be available at some point in a solid form or pill form? Well, um, as I mentioned, that um, people now um, are used at intramural um, NIMH is strictly as an investigational tool to develop better treatment. Um, others are developing um, currently the intravenous use um, in clinics, specialty clinics, and intranasal is being looked at. Um, some pharmaceutical companies are looking at intranasal forms of it, uh, delivery systems, um, and that work is underway. Um, and we should know in the next couple of year or two um, whether uh, some of uh, whether the intranasal form of ketamine will be available or not to the public. That depends on the uh, Food and Drug Administration and the studies that are being done. Now, in terms of other uh, forms. Um, there are 
people are looking at extended release ketamine in the oral form, so on and so forth. But this is very early work. Uh, there is nothing yet available. Um, the the, uh, the the person who asked the question, the question is, is pretty knowledgeable in the sense that uh, ketamine is not really well absorbed by mouth. Uh, it's it, it absorbs less than 20 percent, and it's pretty erratic from individual to individual and in how it's absorbed. It's pretty different, and so um, that question is very important. That um, one would need you know mega doses or very high doses of ketamine delivered orally. And it, it would be very hard to know whether this one dose is the same for another dose. So there's no standardization. So so people are looking at um, more intranasal. And there's some attempts to, to look at a extended um, oral release of ketamine as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, it looks like we have wrapped up the questions. Um, I want, do want to remind everyone that this um, talk has been recorded and will be uploaded to our website um, later today. So please um, visit the website if you want to go back and review or share it with a friend. And again, I thank you so much, um, Dr. Zarati, for all the information you've shared with us today. It's been